the North Yorkshire Moors and time to get a move on. past five in the morning. While the sensible are still snoozing, here in the engine shed at Gromont, they're lighting up some heavy metal monsters. They come from every walk of life people dedicated to keeping steam alive. Volunteers who put the fire in the belly of this living, breathing museum, the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. do everything from maintaining the track and the structures right the way through to operating the trains and selling the tickets. Uh, it's a big operation, nearly four million pounds worth of, uh, of business every year, so you know, that's big by any standards. And we find at this time of year particularly that people who come for a holiday in, in the North Yorkshire Moors, a natural thing for them to do is to spend a day on the railway and they come back year after year so they're obviously enjoying that experience. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks, mate. It's brilliant the way it's run, like, you know. It's great to keep steam trains going anyway, isn't it? Oh, well, we love it. Going on an ordinary train, it's just nothing. Steam engine's got that something about it. Scenic and it's pleasant. Very, very nice. We can't ask for more. Take your time, do not rush onto the train. This is a Pickering, not Piccadilly. <laughs> and this is Goatland, not Aidensfield, although you could forgive the confusion. This railway is familiar to nearly everyone, starring in everything from Heartbeat to Harry Potter. That helps to bring in 300,000 visitors a year, and with it a turnover of four million pounds, fortune as well as fame. I think it was best described one by one of the lads. I've just got a signal to look for. Red. I've just best described by one of the lads as a railway going from nowhere to nowhere through a film set. Travel the 18 miles between Gromont and Pickering, and you take a trip in time. To me, I often joke, it's 1959 here, it's never moved on, and this look around you, the buildings, the scenery, the Yorkshire people, better be careful to say about them, they haven't moved on much, but uh, rightfully so, <laughs> but it's kept it kept its charm and kept its character and kept it as it should be. What it was in, when I started, 1961, the railway, this is how it was. Those coaches are the same colours. This engine is the same colour. Those, this station is painted in those period livery. And uh, it's got it. It's just got that railway atmosphere and that's it. Dennis Wilson's a plumber and a glazier by trade, but a volunteer by calling. Over the years, he's done a lot of DIY here at his second home. 
I was on this railway when it was more or less when it was first started. When there was weeds in this track, six foot high, no windows in any of these, and uh, the work I've done here is unbelievable. I've put done plumbing because I was a I was a farm and plumber, glazing as you can see on all the stations, the Grumman signal box, the Whitby building, the, the Porter's hut, trap maintenance, weeding. <laughs> I think I must be crackers because I love it, you know. People have been coming here, uh, some of them, from 20, 30, 40 years. We have long service badges. And we're quite proud, people are proud that they've been involved for that length of time. And, and so they must be doing something, right? They keep coming back and we're the busiest preserved railway in this country. I think we've now got about 80 full-time staff. We're one of the biggest employers in this area. And, and we're making money. Touch wood. And they need every penny they can get. Running a railway costs a small fortune. But here at Pickering, they're trying to preserve the past and invest in the future. These coaches were sent to the knacker's yard years ago. Now, though, they've been rescued and restored. In their spare time, the first coach took them eight years of work and worry to bring back to life, using skills that were almost lost a generation ago. For the volunteers of Carriage and Wagon, it's been a long and bumpy ride. We started 25 years ago, incredibly. We walked into Yorktown Centre with a fiver and left it with the Leeds Building Society, and that was the start of the LNER Coach Association. And for years we were mocked because these coaches are derelict. When the first one comes and you realise what a state it's in, oh dear, and you strip it down and you say, oh dear, and you think, how on earth are we ever going to do it? In fact, when you walk through them now, when they're absolutely gutted, you do wonder if they'll ever run again. But we have faith, and gradually as the coach uh, transforms into a pristine, gleaming, beautiful coach, there's this wonderful sense of achievement that you, you've actually done something and you can show it. I think the preservationists who do this feel they're contributing to keeping something from the past. Uh, so often nowadays, so much when you look around is what I call modern mediocrity. Like for instance modern trains, they are soulless. But once something's 20, 30 years old or older, it assumes atmosphere. And preserving the past allows your future generations to see what's what. A country that forgets its past has no future. I think it was Winston Churchill who said that. And it's very true, it's, you, you're actually contributing to society by keeping alive old traditions and old artefacts. You can see what drives them, these people with steam in their blood, the men and women with a passion for the sight and the sound of a locomotive pulling up the hills of North Yorkshire. But who'd want to volunteer on a bleak winter's day? Well, these are the gentlemen of the permanent way, the guys who sweat and curse, lay track and heave sleepers just for fun. It's a real backbreaker of a day off. I think this is the time of year when you sort, uh, really sort the men from the boys. You're here in a, in a cold January day, and I mean, it really is freezing today. And they're out here working on this track. Some of them are obviously paid staff, because we do have technical engineers who are highly trained for this sort of work, but a lot of them are volunteers as well, of course. And that shows a tremendous amount of dedication to come out at this time of year. John Hassler's nearly 70. After years of this, he still doesn't want to be anywhere else. In the early days, it was a bit pioneering, you know, to come out and do this sort of thing. And I suppose in the end, it, uh, 
it gets into you. <laughs> I come from a railway family as well, so I, I suppose it, you could get this sort of thing in your blood. Oh, it used to be a lot harder when we used to carry these in by hand. You serve eight, eight people to carry one of these sleepers in. The, they weigh a, what, about 500 weight a piece. When I worked, I used to look forward to getting back into the office for a rest. <laughs> <laughs> I do an office job so I'm sat behind a, behind a desk most days so just to come out and do a bit of exercise and you end up sort of, uh, well like me I'm not very fit so you get sort of fairly knackered fairly quick but that's just nice to get out, a bit of fresh air and a bit of banter. You're putting something back into the railway as well because uh, we like to come down during the summer and take the dog out on the, on the railway and go for a ride and take the dog for a ride and go for a walk, it's sort of putting something back really. And you know, some people love this line so much that they just never want to leave it. Thomas weekend on the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. For parents, it's a chance for a spot of nostalgia. For the kids, it's often their first sight of steam. And does that include Thomas as well? Children may be fascinated by Thomas, but for grown-ups the hobbies become a bit unfashionable, and that's a worry for all of the heritage railways, desperate for new blood. The railway runs an apprentice scheme, but for Kieran, and school leavers like him, it's not always the easiest of career choices. What's so fascinating is that all over the country, Thomas the Tank Engine weekends bring in thousands of children, but there it ends. There is no logical step to keep them within the hobby, and a lot of it is this ridicule factor. They just don't want to have their leg pulled at school as a train spotter. More younger people now these days are more about just going on street corners and playing around. I don't like work now. <laughs> they are interested in trains. The railway hobby as a whole is declining rapidly thanks to the media. They've done this incredible demolition job on the train spotter. <laughs> apparently we all have to wear anoraks and bobble hats. We put numbers in books apparently and this has really deterred the youngsters from coming along. I think we're a bit sad in some ways, but <laughs> I get used to it. I just tell them it's better than staying at home by being bored. It's sad because when you think about it, you can ridicule most hobbies. For instance, um, I can tell you that there are people in this country who um, hit balls into holes you can't see. Or would you believe sit by a river fishing in the rain? And yet, fishing and golf are socially acceptable. You stand on York Station watching trains, you're a head case. Head case. That's what they said about the people who wanted to save this railway back in the 60s. Tom Salmon was one of them. When Dr Beeching began to wield his axe, Tom decided to try and do something to try and save the line he'd visited so many times on family holidays. I got to love that railway and love the area. Newton Dale, I thought, was one of the nicest places on earth. And then, of course, years afterwards, when the beaching plan came up, not only to close a few railways, but pretty well a massacre of all the rural railways in the country. And to my horror, all three Whitby lines were included in the beaching plan. And I couldn't bear to see the Pickering line go. Tom pulled together a small group of people who shared the same passion. Railway men who knew the line and wanted to save it. There were 12 of us started it off. There are now three of us left. One of them, Tom Salmon, to me, is the father of this railway. 
If it hadn't been for Tom, I don't think any of us would have bothered. We were railway men, and the railway was dying, beaching was pulling it from together and so forth. But I don't think we realised it. Tom did. Tom Salmon began a crusade, spreading the vision of a self-supporting private railway. He sweet-talked businessmen, persuaded the public, and set fire to the local imagination. Well, it was a tremendous undertaking because we didn't have anything to show. We didn't have a line, we didn't have any coaches, we didn't have any engines, so it was selling an idea. And that went on for the first 18 months. We had to go out, find members, find the funding. We ran raffles, whist drives, jumble sales, sponsored walks, anything that would uh, bring in money. And we also went out and spoke at meetings all over the northeast of England to enrol members, anything we could do to get the message out. And by the time we had our first public meeting in November of 67, uh, that was at Gothland Parish Hall, crowded out and very excited, we'd gone up to 620 members from nothing. Finally, in 1973, the end of the beginning. With a royal flourish, the line was open again. There was happy pride in what they'd done, the joy of achieving the impossible. Well, it was fantastic. It really was a very, very exciting day when the D Duchess of Kent came up and reopened the line. And it was nice that uh, some of the people who had uh, put so much effort into it were invited to the reception. And then she travelled down on the, uh, on the train to Pickering. It, it's very gratifying, really. I'm glad I did what I did and didn't just sit back and watch the line go. This show's life member number one, my wife's is life num member number two, and every time I travel on the train, I can't resist when I show my ticket putting my membership card down as well. <laughs> Even the founders couldn't have imagined what a success the line would become, now Britain's most popular heritage railway. It's kept alive by people like Peter Best, a businessman who runs his own engineering company and collects steam engines for a hobby. Peter needs overalls with very deep pockets. I've been a volunteer since 1989 um, and in uh, 1992 bought my first of four locomotives. Uh, I bought two of that year and a, another one in um, uh, 1999. Of course you have to ask, why? Uh, well, uh, I've got a uh, passion for steam. Uh, I've owned steam rollers and traction engines before uh, full-size locomotives like this. And it also contributes to the railway, which, which I love, which is North Yorkshire Moors Railway. Obsession comes at a cost, but Peter would never question the value of saving steam engines in spite of the price. If you want to buy a um, sort of medium-sized locomotive like this one, uh, it'll probably uh, cost about 250 to £300,000 to buy. Uh, every 10 years the locomotive needs a full overhaul where the boiler's got to be lifted and the boiler work's got to be uh, um, attended to. And um, uh, an average restoration now will cost uh, another 250,000 to 300,000 pounds depending on the, the work needed. Uh, so it's a very, very expensive hobby. Uh, now we get income from, for hiring the locomotives out, but uh, um, um, no one makes any money out of owning a steam locomotive. This line survives because of people like Peter, those who give everything they've got to keep the railway running. It's more than their hobby, it's their life. I think the thing about steam and steam enthusiasm for these men is that it's like, almost like an illness, a disease. <laughs> and if they've got it, they've got it. And I think when I first met Peter, I soon realised you can't beat it, so you might as well join it. <laughs>
<laughs> so I didn't ever sort of try and resist it. I've always encouraged him and been enthusiastic. He runs a very successful business and a great deal of the uh, income from it goes into the railway locomotives. I think if people knew just how much, they wouldn't believe it. Ironically, Peter owns four engines, but he's not allowed to actually drive any of them. It takes years of training and work as a fireman to learn the skills to become an engine driver. There'll be a lot of sweat and slog before he can finally take the controls himself. And much to everybody's amusement, really, I, I'm, I'm working my way through the, uh, through the ranks of, of the uh, uh, footplate department. I'm now a fireman. I'm training to be a driver, but I'm not yet a qualified driver, so uh, uh, it's only when I'm uh, on a training turn can I actually drive my own locomotive. He loves to see people enjoying themselves. He says nothing gives him more pleasure than coming up to the railway and um, watching people getting on and off the trains, you know, knowing that um, you know, he, he's helped to contribute towards it. The satisfaction of actually finishing a job like this and, and after 22 years or three, two and a half years, three years of work, for it all to be put together again, a fire put into it, and uh, it becomes a, a live, living and breathing as a steam locomotive again. It, it is a very, very big thrill, um, and uh, I enjoy it to this day, um, firing it and, and operating it, and uh, um, long may it continue, really. As long as I can afford to do so, then uh, I will do so. <laughs> Next time on Yorkshire Steam, join the footplate crews for the railway's annual gala. Happy again! <laughs> I told you it was a character, you can't get out of that one. <laughs>